Well, good morning. Uh, greetings from New York City. Any of you guys ever live in New York City? We live in the, the South Bronx. People always tell me when I come to places like this, I, I've been to the Bronx before. I passed through once. It was the worst moment of my life. But we, we love the Bronx. We've lived in New York for 16 uh, years, and uh, it's been an interesting experience for sure. Now, I know you guys in Connecticut are pretty smart, but I'm going to teach you a new word today. I know it's a new word because it's an invented word that one of our Bangladeshi missionaries came up with to describe God's activity in the world. He said, you know, I'm from Bangladesh. I was a Muslim, very fundamental Muslim area of Bangladesh, and I became a follower of Jesus. Well, the imam didn't like that, and he wanted my father to take a sickle and cut off my head in the middle of the night. My father did not do that. Do you know why? I said, no, I do not know why. He said, because God has super plans. I went, oh, okay. And he said, but I couldn't get married in Bangladesh because I was Muslim. It was arranged marriages. They did not want to give me a wife because I'd become a Christian. The Christian background people, they didn't like me because I used to be Muslim. I win a Muslim woman to the Lord. Several years later, we become married. You see, God has super plan. He said, but everywhere in Bangladesh, people would try to chase me and kill me. And finally, I came to New York where I could share openly the gospel with over 150,000 Bangladeshis in New York. And then through technology, we're able to reach back into Bangladesh and share with so many people. You see, God has super plan. He said, I didn't come here just for the American dream. I came because of a larger story of what God is doing, shaping, shaking people from where they live and around the world in connection to other people. It's part of God's redemptive purposes. In Acts 17, 26, we see this picture. Paul is speaking to people in Athens, and I want you to hear these words. It says, he, God, made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth having determined the allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place that they should seek God and perhaps fill their way toward him and find him, yet he's actually not far from each one of us. You hear that? God has appointed the times and the boundaries of people's habitation that they might seek him. Now, I speak an African language called Bomber. It's my party trick in New York. Like, hey, what do you do? I can just break out in an African language. And, and one of the proverbs they have in Mali says, which means a chicken mouth is too small to blow the horn. It's basically something to put you in your place. You're not that important. Realize where you are. Well, I am too unimportant to talk about political realities and everything that goes into immigration policies and all that. It's not my world. However, what I do know is that God is somehow behind the times and places of people's habitations for the spread of the gospel, and that as Christ followers, we have an obligation and an opportunity to love our neighbors, and the world has come next door. I know lots of people who have been missionaries in Yemen and places like that where it's very difficult to actually openly be a Christian, and all of them have either been killed or lost their platform to live in the country for a long period. Yet Yemenis own all the bodegas, Spanish word for convenience store, they own all the bodegas in New York City practically. You can buy a hoagie, Italian, and have access to Yemen in a convenience store in New York City. That is what's happening today. So I want to highlight some of these sociological realities through the lens of Scripture and God's revelation through Christ that have implications for our daily lives and aligning with God's super plan. If nothing else, you'll remember that word today. Uh, several years ago, I was on a bench, 72nd Street and Broadway, Upper West Side of New York, pigeons flying all around, and a Muslim guy from Senegal had just read God's word for the first time, and he was telling me his thoughts. He says, you know, Chris, it is like a movie, and God, he is like the director, and Satan, he's like the bad guy, and all of us are like actors and actresses in this movie that's unfolding still today. Well, some of us are like extras, but what he was describing is something that a lot of times we miss in American Christianity, 
This isn't just some amazing thing that happened 2,000 plus years ago with amazing people. These were ordinary people that got wrapped up in a larger story. And guess what? That larger story of God redeeming all peoples to himself is still unfolding today. And I would even say we live in the most exciting time in history for the multitude of nations coming to Christ. God is saving a multitude from all peoples of the earth. Uh, we're familiar with the Great Commission, go make disciples of all nations. I always thought of nations like geopolitical countries. There's around 200 countries in the world. I said, we're probably doing pretty good at that. But then I started realizing that word in Greek in the Bible is ethnos or ethne in plural. It's where we get the word ethnic groups. There are around 17,000 ethnic groups in the world. And still today, 2,000 years after Christ died and rose again, 43% are unreached. Hardly any Christian presence among 43% of the world's peoples. 86% of the world's Muslims, Hindus, and Buddhists have never met a Christian, much less heard an opportunity to respond to the gospel. We visited one of these groups in Mali once and we said, hey, why are you Muslim? And they thought about it for a while and they said, they got here first. And they had been there for 200 years before any Christian set foot among their people. In essence, they were saying, look, if your way is really that important, it's a matter of heaven and hell, it's a matter of right relationship with God, why is it taking you so long to get here? And yet that is the reality. Revelation 7, 9 through 10 says, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes, peoples, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and the Lamb. We know the end story as Christians. We know that a great multitude, which no one can count from every tribe, tongue, language, will be represented before the throne. We know that our reality today is that 43% of those are still unreached. I kind of see this like a, a chick flick or an action movie. Everyone knows how it's going to end. You know, the man and the woman are going to get together in the end. In the, in the action movie, he's surrounded by 50 bad guys, but he's going to get out and live. You know, he's not going to die. You know how it's going to end. You just don't know how it's going to unfold. That's what we're like today. We know there's a great multitude, but we don't know how God is going to work that salvation out among all peoples. But the fact is, God chooses us to be involved in that super plan. In 1792, there was a guy named William Carey in England who really wasn't that educated. He really wasn't an important pastor or of a large church, but he went before his denomination and he... he wrote a pamphlet, an essay, encouraging them to start, basically, missions in the world. He said, look, we're sending merchants all around the world, we're colonizing, we're doing all of these things. Why are we not sharing the hope of our salvation with them? And so he wrote an essay with a great title called An Inquiry into the Obligation of Christians to Use Means for the Conversion of the Heathen. And then there was a longer subtitle that I don't remember and somehow that caught on, even though one of the leaders of the denomination said, young man, sit down. You are an enthusiast. When God pleases to convert the heathen, he'll do it without consulting you or me. He basically said, God doesn't need us. And of course he was right. God doesn't need us. But what that leader did not realize is even though God doesn't need us, it is all throughout Scripture that He chooses us. He chooses the lowly of the world to despise the wise. He doesn't need us, but He calls us, like in 2 Corinthians 5, as ministers of reconciliation. He calls us to be His ambassadors, is the word used in the English translation. His ambassadors, His representatives in this world. 86% of Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists have never met a Christian and we are his ambassadors, his representatives. What are we doing to make sure God's agenda is being worked out in this world? I set foot in a, I think it was in Massachusetts, in New England. It was a Buddhist temple, and we took a church. We went there. We talked with the, the monk that was there. 
She said she had been here for 20 years, and she had talked with three Christians in 20 years. And she was very open. She said, please come back at any time. God chooses us to be involved in His super plan. Peoples of the world, those unreached ethnic groups, are migrating and connecting to cities in historical proportions. And if you hear cities and you begin checking out because you despise some place like New York City, two-thirds of immigrants in the U.S. now do not live in the center city in metro areas, but they have come out to the outer areas surrounding cities. The Bible begins in a garden, but it ends in a city. I was reading in Hebrews 11 recently, and Abraham said, uh, or it said that he lived in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with them of the same promise, but he was looking forward to the city that has foundations whose designer and builder is God. We know that in the end, this heavenly city is our destiny. When you look at migration stats around the world today, around 280 million international migrants exist. It is double the number of just 30 years ago. 56% of the world's population is also urban. It was 43% 30 years ago, and these numbers just continue to climb around the world. And so we read passages like, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And we get this picture of geographic centers and you go out. The fact is, God has made the ends of the earth near in our time through migration and urbanization. The world has moved next door. I used to live in a mud hut, no electricity, no running water in Mali, in one of the least developed countries in the world. Even today, they don't have electricity or running water. But do you know what they have today? Cell phones, powered by car batteries. And you know where those cell phones connect to? Cities in their country, but also migrants from their village who have moved to places like Paris and New York even if they have not moved to the cities, they are now connected to cities. And I can definitively say that if my mud hut, no electricity, no running water village is now connected to cities. So our cities become, uh, they're very complex, but one thing they are is this conglomeration of distinct people groups. There's a map that will go up on the screen that shows languages that they've identified in New York over 800 languages that they have seen spoken in New York City. And although people in the city relate at various levels with all sorts of society, whether at work, school, neighborhood, hobbies, interest, their underlying worldview is shaped at an early age on who is our people and who is not our people. Some of the most influential churches in New York, people have told me, from those churches. We thought we'd start this church and it would just trickle down and reach all of the peoples of the city. And we realized after all of these years, we haven't touched unreached peoples. Their worldviews, their culture keep them from coming into church. And so we have to be intentional with this opportunity. And cities are the most strategic and accessible places in the world to reach a diversity of peoples. In Mali, I actually went to Timbuktu. You've heard of Timbuktu, symbolic of the ends of the earth. Well, I've been there. It exists. You can actually get there by plane, but it's cheating. So we went by canoe with hippos all around us, and it was fantastic. But it was so difficult to get from place to place, from people group to people group in Mali, sometimes over washboard roads where you just kind of like someone shakes you for two hours and you have to get out and scream and kind of let it all loose and get back in. Well, today, those same peoples will live within the same apartment complex in places like New York, and you can go into a store and sit there for 10 minutes and meet members of 10 different unreached groups. You have access in ways that we have never had before. And our cities reflect the worst and best of humanity. They're neither fully of Satan, of God. It's like the kingdom is being waged, this war is being waged in the cities. It's the worst of humanity. It's the centers of rebellion, evil, independence uh, from God. You see this in Genesis with Babel, Noah, 
All his people come out of the ark. It says, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. But instead, they gathered in one place to make a name for themselves. And because of their rebellion and seeking independence of God, God scrambled their languages and spread them out over the earth. Babel later becomes known as Babylon and is seen throughout Scripture as symbolic of that rebellion. In Revelation 17, 5, it calls Babylon the mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. That's pretty bad. But also we see cities in a good light. Jerusalem means the city of peace. It's the holy city. When Solomon brought the ark to the temple and dedicated uh, this ark, he said, God, when the foreigners come here, the non-Hebrews come from all of the world into the city and they pray towards this temple, it says, may you hear their prayers in order that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you. So even in the Old Testament, we see this picture of foreigners coming into the city to know the living God. And of course, Revelation ends with this vision of New Jerusalem, the eternal city. So the city reflects the worst and best of humanity, and the city, for better or for worse, begins influencing the peoples within them. I learned of this influence uh, through a, another new word created by immigrants, uh, people from Ecuador. They talked about how uh, we have to, we're in the city, we have to live in the Ioni way, the Ioni way. He said, you know, in Ecuador, you know, machismo, the women have this certain place, the men, they don't cook, they don't do all of that, but it changes in New York. You've got to cook, you've got to take care of things. It's the Ioni way. What do you mean, Ioni? Well, they said, you, you know, I love in Y. The Ioni, the Ioni way. <laughs> I went, oh. And so the cities influence the peoples within them. At the same time, the city's peoples influence the country and a globalized world. We have certainly seen this during COVID. Uh, March two years ago, New York City got hit hard by COVID. I had major fatigue for 45 days after getting hit that March of that year. I remember, you know, no one knew what was going on. What is this thing? Where is it coming from? And eventually there was a map created a couple of months after things started. And all throughout the country, they traced 95% uh, of COVID cases back to New York City. And I went, oh, you know, there you go. You know, once again, the city influencing uh, the rest of the world, sometimes not in a positive way. It can certainly be a good thing as well in uh, the New Testament, Paul would reach cities and felt so confident in the church in the city reaching out to the entire region that he wrote to the Romans, said, there's nowhere else for me to preach in this region. I don't want to step foot on anyone's foundation, so can you send me to Spain? The only way he'd be able to say that is because he knew the DNA of the church in the city would naturally trickle out and reach people in that region. We had a, a Wolof woman from Senegal come to Christ the last few years. There are 8 million or so Wolof in the world and maybe 300 known Christians. Within the Wolof, there is a particular Islamic sect that are very powerful politically. They are known for their sorcery. Uh, they really keep a close reign on their people. And there are only a handful of believers among this particular Islamic sect. Well, Mbai, this woman, was from this sect, and she came to Christ in New York. Because their city's peoples influenced the rest of the world, when she came to Christ, it wasn't some just great strategy we had for her. She just naturally did it. She started sharing with her networks around the world. Within 18 months, she saw friends or family come to Christ in Florida, in Montreal, in New York, in France, in Italy, and her home of Senegal, where around 10 family members came to Christ there. You reach people in the city, and they will naturally spread around the world. So our global gateway cities, migration and technology become new Roman roads for spreading the good news of Jesus to the unreached peoples and places of the world. Roman roads existed during the, the first church. Uh, after Christ died and rose again and sent the apostles out, they traveled mainly along Roman roads. So today in, uh, in 
northern part of Africa, in Egypt. They'll trace the Christian heritage back to Mark. Even the Apostle Thomas eventually worked his way into southern India, in the Kerala area of India. And so it traveled along Roman roads. Today our Roman roads are technology, migration, uh, globalization. Uh, we saw this with actually the same guy, I call him Aslam, in a book I wrote. Uh, he is the one who coined the word super plan, and during COVID, he said, you know, what are we all going to do? We're all stuck in our apartments. He said, this is an opportunity. It's a super plan. Let's start a Zoom meeting for Muslim background Christians around the world who all know how to use Zoom now. And so they started the Zoom meeting. It starts meeting three hours every day. Within months, it grew to three, four, five hundred people meeting three hours a day over Zoom. Bangladeshi Muslim background Christians from Bangladesh, from India, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, Dubai, Paris, London, Toronto, on and on. And they said, let's... Let's start taking up funds to take care of all of these people affected by COVID. Hey, we should elect elders to kind of lead this group. Hey, we should start discipling the women and the youth. And they became basically a Zoom church. And the Muslims who wanted to investigate Christian community heard about what was going on in the Zoom meeting. The Muslims start investigating what's going on. 200 Muslim background people were baptized as followers of Christ within that first year of a Zoom church starting. God has a super plan of using all of these things. So looking at what God is doing around the world, he is saving a multitude from all peoples. He chooses us to be involved in that super plan. Peoples are migrating and connecting to cities in historical pro proportions. So cities become these conglomerations of distinct peoples and they're the most strategic and accessible places to reach the diversity of unreached peoples of the world. They also reflect the worst and best of humanity, and that begins influencing the city's peoples. But then the city's peoples influence the rest of the country in a globalized world. And global gateway cities, migration, and technology become the new Roman roads for spreading the good news of Jesus to the unreached people and places of the world. Now, here are some practical steps that you can take to embrace God's super plan through the world next door. First is to view the proximity to unreached peoples through migration, urbanization, and technology with a super plan lens. We all see things through a certain lens. And to be honest, a lot of uh, Christians in this country, we will view the world through more of a cultural lens than a biblical lens. We'll see the world more through a political lens. We'll see the world more through a racial or ethnic lens. We'll become more white American or African American or Puerto Rican in the way we see things than we do biblical. But the fact is, God is behind this migration in some way for a greater purpose. And if we see it through a super plan lens, we see of new opportunities. And that's the first place to start. We had a missionary that worked with us for a while in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. She's from the neighborhood, grew up in the neighborhood. She said, I never saw the Muslims. You know, another word for unreached people groups is hidden people groups. The church don't see them. And as a result, they don't interact with them. She said, it took me moving Going to, she went to school in New England. She read an article about the peoples of New York, and she said, ah, that's my neighborhood. I've never seen that. And she went back on vacation, and she started seeing little Yemen in Bay Ridge and people from Syria and Palestine. And she said, how have I never seen them? If you begin to just change the lens, you start seeing your coworkers and your neighborhood in different ways as well. You know, like, huh. I wonder who that person is. I've never really noticed them. And just because you notice them, you begin seeking opportunities to hear their story and find out, oh, wow, maybe they're one of those unreached people. And maybe there's an opportunity for the gospel going forth around the world through them. Be intentional where you live, shop, and play to create more opportunities to meet people that have the least Christian influence on their lives. We all have our ways and places we go that give us the least interaction with people, but maybe we can be more intentional about where we live and shop that would give us more super plan opportunities. 
Maybe an Arabic store has opened up in some neighborhood nearby, and you can just go and get your groceries delivered, or you can actually go buy rice from that Arabic store and give you natural opportunities to build relationships. Be an intentional gospel witness with your existing relationships among coworkers, fellow students, neighbors, and friends. One of the most, or actually the most effective missionary among West African Muslim women in North America is a Fulani Muslim background Christian woman from Guinea who ended up studying in Eastern Europe, which led her to work in Paris. And as a strong conservative Muslim woman, a Cambodian French woman saw her not just as a coworker, but as someone to pray for and hopefully lead to Christ. And she did, and she sought an opportunity, um, prayed, 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 and eventually gave that woman uh, a testimony of a African imam who came to Christ and all of these incredible stories that followed. And she said, oh, this speaks to me. Thank you so much for sharing. And she eventually became a follower of Christ, now a missionary among her people. That all started just because a coworker saw her job not just as a place to earn money, or practice her skills, but maybe part of a super plan. Use your gifts for God's global mission. You know, in the past, pioneer missionaries around the world among these groups looked a lot like Indiana Jones. You know, they, they were adventurers and explorers, or they were heavy into development work. The people that have the most access, the Christians that have the most access to unreached peoples of the world today look a lot like you. They're business people. They have skills in international business that give them connections with an entire world that sometimes is very difficult to access as a professional evangelist or missionary. Uh, There's actually a Hispanic guy from New England uh, that I know that he, he started putting on the super plan lens and he said, you know what? I go, I do contract work around the world and I basically go and try to find the jobs I'm going to start searching for jobs in the least reached Muslim areas of the world. And he told me a story recently. He's actually texting me on the plane, and all of a sudden he started because he said they're starting to bug my phone, I can tell. But he, through his business, went into a very unreached Muslim country, met one of the leaders of that country on the plane, was invited to the guy's home, shared the gospel, even though missionaries are being killed in the country. And now that guy is inviting my friend to vacation with his family. All because he just sought his business in a new way to give him access to peoples of the world. Missionaries that are professional evangelists and church planners, they also need people with skills that they're often not skilled at. Things like graphic design and web development and app development and all of those things are incredibly useful for on-the-ground missionaries. So you could align your work with those people. Some very practical opportunities is you can take a virtual prayer walk through one of these unreached people group communities in North America. We've been developing a new site called upgnorthamerica.com. And if you're saying, well, you know, it's a little too much for me to just walk into a Buddhist temple right now. We'll go, okay, how about this? Take a prayer walk through Tibetan New York. And using all the intimate photos that Google provides and the copyright issues being with them, you can actually walk into the Buddhist temples, and you can see their faces, and you can see their places, and allow that to stir you to prayer, and hopefully build up the confidence one day to actually talk to them. Uh, Today, there will be a, a a lunch where we talk about Ramadan and the importance of this fasting month of Ramadan for Muslims, and why it's important for Christians to pray for Muslims during that time. There's been a concentrated effort to pray for Muslims during Ramadan for at least 30 years, and it's no uh, coincidence that a Muslim movement to Christ has been taking place over the last 30 years as well. Be inspired to find your role in God's super plan. I I like that word so much. I wrote a book called Super Plan, A Journey into God's Story, and it kind of tells my own story of leaving behind just the cultural expectations around me and seeking to follow God's super plan, even when there's suffering involved in that, and it interweaves that story with three Muslim background Christians, including Aslam from Bangladesh, 
and how they didn't have just incredible stories of coming to Christ, but they chose to love their people despite the fact that their people were trying to kill them. And as a result, God is using them in amazing ways to see Muslims come to Christ. And hopefully, I've written this in a way that you find your own unique role in God's super plan because we all have unique stories. On that website, if you go into resources, there are next step ideas. It's a free resource. And you can say, well, you know, what does that practically mean? Well, there's all sorts of things, dozens and dozens and dozens of practical ways people have found their next steps in God's super plan. So I encourage you to look at that and explore what that might look like for you. Take a short-term trip. Uh, Avon, uh, this church here, Valley Community, is going to take a trip to work among Turks in Little Turkey and Little Arabia in Patterson, New Jersey with Global Gates, my organization, uh, this summer in June. So I encourage you to look up that info and get some experience talking to someone who's very, very far from God. And what you'll usually end up uh, arriving at is, wow, those people weren't as scary as I thought. It's actually quite pleasant to talk to them. They really wanted to talk about religion. Why have I been so scared to talk about my faith? I was always told you don't talk about religion and politics, but all that they wanted to talk about was religion and politics. That happens. Hey, those people aren't that special. I can go do this back in my home. And so get that experience. In conclusion, Really ask what the Holy Spirit is saying to you with this whole super plan thing. How can you be more involved in what God is doing around the world? He does not need you. He doesn't, but he chooses you. Let's pray. Lord, help us to all find our role in your story. Uh, you are doing amazing things around the world. And Lord, help us not just get in this rut where we just invite you into our story instead of laying down our lives to enter into your story. Help us know uh, the next steps for how to enter more into that. Help us to see the peoples that we have ignored or just haven't seen because we were looking through a different lens. Help us have a super plan lens. In Christ's name, amen.